Hello, everyone. I'm James Neiman, a self signaling technology account manager for Biopharm in Massachusetts, and welcome to today's CSD Learning Live session. Uh, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Jessica Simmendinger, who is one of our IT scientists at CSD. Jessica has over 13 years' experience in the immunohistochemical technique with a primary focus on the development, optimization, and validation of IHC grade antibodies in various research areas. Today, she's going to discuss how to optimize the antibody for IHC, and during the session, you will also have the opportunity to ask questions by typing, typing them into the GoToWebinar questions area in your control panel. For those of you who are just joining us, welcome again to the CST Learning Lab live session. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to our IHC expert, Jessica Simendinger. Hi there. Uh, hello, thanks so much for being here today. I am grateful for the opportunity to speak with you on how to optimize an antibody for IHC. So, you have a new antibody in your lab and you want to optimize the antibody for immunohistochemistry. Before assessing the staining results on your experimental tissues of undetermined protein expression, it's a good idea to optimize the antibody first. What model do you use to start? There may be recommendations on protocol, dilution, reagents to use with this antibody from the antibody vendor, and you may have a staining protocol that you routinely use in your lab. How do you come up with the best combination of antibody plus staining model plus protocol that will result in the best staining? We know that differences in protocols and reagents can impact staining results. It is good practice to determine the optimal conditions under which the antibody will perform at its best in your lab. Your precious experiments are worth that effort. So the plan today is to go over your model determination, considerations on your IHC protocol, then we'll do tissue titration, and I'll just touch on some further validation tools. When setting out to optimize a new antibody, an important consideration is the choice of model system on which to begin testing. The goal is to use a reliable model of known protein expression, or at the very least, a model that is highly likely to have detectable expression. It can be quite unfortunate to attempt staining using a new antibody on a model that happens to be negative for the protein. So how do we determine a suitable initial staining model? It can be useful to browse published literature to learn more about where your protein of interest is expected to be expressed and to get ideas on a reliable model to use. I do encourage you to use caution, however, when interpreting published IHC data as conclusions made based on staining assays alone are only as good as the antibody used. Conclusions that have support via more than one assay, including those non-antibody-based assays, those are likely to be more reliable. One example I'll share is that of GFAP. This protein has been well studied, and so we know it should be expressed in brain and nerves only. For this reason, brain can serve as a reliable positive model. Liver is a suitable negative model. And a tissue such as colon that shows staining of nerves in the myenteric plexus has elements of both positive and negative in the same tissue. This brings me to another important point. A reliable positive model is necessary, but the inclusion of a known negative model is also important. We tend to get excited when we observe staining in a tissue expected to be positive, but if there's also signal in other tissues expected to be negative, then unfortunately you do not have a specific assay. For successful IHC, we want to ensure there is positive staining where we expect and no staining where the protein is not expected to be expressed. So that GFAP example is of a target of well understood protein expression. Unfortunately, not all targets are that straightforward. Maybe your target of interest is relatively novel and published information is limited. Or maybe your target is expressed in some but not all tissues of a given type such as those that are reported to be upregulated in a subset of certain tumors. For example, this protein X is predicted to be upregulated in 30% of prostate carcinoma cases. These types of targets can be tricky. You can't be certain that the prostate carcinoma tissue block you have in your lab will have detectable expression of our protein X. You may try staining your prostate block, but be sure to note that a negative result in this tissue doesn't necessarily mean there's an issue with the antibody or protocol. It may just be that the tissue doesn't have detectable expression. So what do you do in this case? For us, we'll often begin optimization on a formalin fixed paraffin embedded cell model of known protein expression. These kind of cell pellet controls can be quite valuable in optimizing a new antibody for IHC. They can serve as positive or negative, high or low models, 
and the cells can be treated in numerous ways to modulate expression. We determine which models may be appropriate to use for each target via Western blot testing or other assays. We'll also use publicly available resources such as BioGPS, DepMap Portal, CCLE, and Human Protein Atlas to aid in identifying candidate cell lines to use. Cell pellet models are a reliable first test. They can offer some assurance that your antibody is worth pursuing further and also that your protocol is sound. Be sure to note, however, that a successful result in a cell model does not guarantee performance in tissue. So in-house, we'll typically start with cell pellets, like I mentioned, and then we'll move on to tissue testing. Some additional tools that can be useful to predict protein expression in tissues also include some of these public, like, publicly available databases that have compiled gene and protein information, such as Phosphocyte Plus, Unipro, Human Protein Atlas. For example, Human Protein Atlas has valuable RNA data avail available for most proteins. And now while RNA expression does not always correlate with protein expression, it is a good place to start and has proven to be useful for us for many proteins. So take this example here. This particular protein has high RNA in normal human liver and very low to no RNA in multiple tissues, including thymus. So we included normal human liver and thymus in our testing. And we found that our staining results correlated rather well and that these tissues will work as positive and negative controls for this protein. So now that you have a model set, we go on to the IHC protocol. Does your lab have a set protocol? What does the antibody vendor suggest? Differences in IHC protocols between labs can lead to notable differences in staining results. We should strive for the best chance for success at the outset. So now I'll share some points to consider when deciding on a staining protocol. First to note on your cut tissue sections. While protein episodes are well preserved in FFPE blocks, antigenicity can decrease in tissue sections that were previously cut and the slides stored for some period of time. For this reason, we recommend cutting fresh sections when possible. Allow those slides to air dry and use within a few days. If your sections must be cut in advance, storage of the slides at 4C is preferred over room temperature. Antigen retrieval is a step in the IHC protocol that can differ greatly from lab to lab and can account for notable differences in staining results between labs. Look to the vendor website or data sheet for recommendations on retrieval type and buffer. Heat-induced epitope retrieval is more commonly used than enzymatic retrieval, though there are some antibodies that prefer enzyme treatment. We use HIER with sodium citrate most often and EDTA in more limited cases. EDTA can increase positive signals but may also increase background and thus primary antibody dilutions may need to be tweaked for optimal signal to noise. See this example here, where the EGFR antibody 4267 shows staining with citrate and stronger staining with EDTA. This antibody does not stain following enzymatic retrieval. The comparison mouse monoclonal antibody does not work following HIER retrieval with citrate or EDTA, and it does show staining with enzymatic retrieval using pepsin. The message here is that the optimal antigen retrieval type is antibody specific and not target specific. The apparatus used for heat-induced epitope retrieval can also impact staining results. A pressure cooker provides the most consistent results. The microwave works well, is accessible in many labs, and is the appar apparatus we use most frequently. We have calibrated our microwaves in-house and use a set protocol each time in attempts to provide consistent retrieval. A water bath may not provide sufficient retrieval, and so it's not recommended. Let's talk about blocking steps. Hydrogen peroxide quench should be included when HRP detection is employed. The reagent should be made up in water, not methanol, as it's been reported that methanol can be damaging to certain epitopes. There can be differences in antibody performance depending on which blocking reagent is used. For example, we have seen that blocking reagents that contain casein can result in weaker staining for some antibodies, notably phospho-specific antibodies. We routinely use 5% normal goat serum diluted in TBST. We use this reagent as as the secondary we routinely use was produced in goat. We also have an animal-free blocking reagent that is plant-based. In side-by-side -side comparisons, staining results were similar using this reagent um, versus goat serum. So another variable in the IHC staining assay is the choice of primary antibody diluent. 
different reagents can produce different staining results, and this phenomenon also appears to be antibody dependent. Some antibodies prefer one rate reagent, while others may perform better when diluted in another. The duration of the primary antibody incubation can impact staining results. In this example, the same antibody, dilution, and protocol is seen on each section. The only change is the length of primary antibody incubation, one hour versus overnight. Please also note that the antibodies that we have tested do work with a shorter incubation. It is just that the conditions for optimal staining may need to be adjusted versus the overnight conditions, notably that primary antibody dilution. We have found that all antibodies tested in-house that work well using an overnight incubation also work well on the Leica Bond auto stainer, which also uses a shorter incubation. Now, when choosing which type of secondary detection to use in your staining assay, you may want to consider the increased amplification offered when using a polymer over avidin biotin HRP-based detection. In side-by-side -side testing, polymer-based detection consistently shows a more impressive positive signal. Finally, it's a good idea to initially titrate the antibody at multiple serial dilution points on a positive and negative model, or as in this example here, a model that includes both positive and negative tissue elements. Look for the presence of specific signal versus background or nonspecific signal. The optimal dilution is the point where the positive signal is as strong as possible and any background is alleviated. So how does one perform careful and complete antibody validation? At CST, we focus on the hallmarks of antibody validation, six complementary strategies that can be used to determine the functionality, specificity, and sensitivity of an antibody in a given assay. I will briefly share how these strategies are used in IHC validation. So binary models, models of known protein negative expression. This may include cells or tissues, models of wild type versus genetic knockouts. For ranged expression, models of known continuum of expression, so high, medium, low expressors, cells or tissues, um, also assays such as siRNA. Orthogonal data is when we can correlate results to non-antibody-based assays, such as mass spec, ish. It can be quite valuable to include more than one antibody, so um, and this is the multiple antibodies header. It can be valuable to have two antibodies that detect different portions of the protein. When similar staining is observed between these two antibodies, we can have increased confidence in the specificity of that staining pattern. This can be quite useful for novel proteins with limited um, available publications. Heterologous expression, um, where a model is made to express the target protein. An example of this would be a transfected cell model to ensure our antibody is specific to the target protein versus close family members or other similar proteins. We also routinely perform complementary assays, which may include peptide blocking to, com to um, confirm methyl specificity, acetyl specificity, or lambda phosphatase testing to assess phospho-specific staining. Be sure to note that no single assay is sufficient to verify the specificity of staining observed. Instead, it is the combination of validation techniques that provides confidence in the antibody specificity. So to summarize some considerations when optimizing a new antibody for IHC, be sure to include a reliable model to start. Protocol variations can impact staining results, so carefully consider each step for the best chance for success. Perform a titration to determine the dilution point where optimal signal to noise is achieved, and consider the hallmarks of validation to further support the specificity of the staining observed. Thank you so much for your attention. Please note we are always happy to connect and provide support. Switching over to you, James. Excellent. Thank you, Jessica. That was great. Um, we will now move to the Q&A portion of the webinar. And as a reminder, if you have a question for Jessica you haven't already submitted, you can do so in the field of the questions section on your GoToWebinar control panel. And I have the first question here. Um, Jess, so how do you select which diluent to use? Okay, um, it's probably a good idea when you're looking to 
set up your protocol and trying to decide your reagents, including what diluent to use, that you go with first what the vendor recommends. Um, if, the vec if the vendor has a nice assay that works well and so their diluent works well, it's probably worth trying that same diluent. If you end up uh, getting staining results and you want to tweak them to get a more impressive signal, then you may consider making changes at that time. Excellent. Um, a question that just came up was, because uh, I know we do a lot of FFPE um, stainings, but if you're staining frozen tissue, uh, how, what's the best way to select the fixatives that you would use? Yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, frozen testing does differ from paraffin embedded. Um, so generally when we start um, to set up a frozen tissue staining assay, we do an optimization of fixatives first because we've, we found that um, not all antibodies perform the same um, with the same fixatives. So we generally try acetone, um, neutral buffered formalin, paraformaldehyde, or paraformaldehyde with a methanol um, incubation following that, and then perform a titration. Um, we found that one or another usually perform better than the other. So, so like I said, we do we, we test them all. Okay, excellent. Um, there's a couple here, let me see. Um, so when we know um, that you've tested an antibody that works on FFPE on cell pellets, will it also work when using fluorescent, uh, well, on cells using fluorescent immunocytochemistry? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, there are occasions in which an antibody may work for both types of cell preps, um, but very often it is the case that they do not. Um, when you think about how the samples are prepared and how the staining assays are done, um, the presentation of the epistope can be different. Um, so in your FFPE cell pellets, um, the cells are well fixed in formalin, forms the, the cross links between the proteins, and then antigen retrieval must be done to expose the epitopes to the antibody. So those epitopes present in the FFPE cell pellets may differ from those in um, cultured cells grown on a slide, briefly fixed. And so, um, there, like I said, there's a chance they may work, but due to the differences in epitope presentation, it's, it's not surprising that in many cases they do not work for both. And one, so there you go. So one is not indicative of the other. And um, you must validate in either assay if that's your assay of interest. And is there a protocol for that, for, for, for generating the, the cell pellets? Oh, yes. Um, we, so we make our own cell pellets in-house, and I'm sure there are protocols available uh, in, you know, for, uh, via publications as well. But it's, it's rather simple. You use immortalized cell lines, um, either adherent or non-adherent. Um, if they're non-adherent, you spin them down. If they're adherent cells, you scrape in PBS, spin them down. There's a short fix. And then we mix the cells with a histogel and form into a pellet mold. And then we put in a biopsy cassette and fix overnight. And then the samples are processed just like tissue samples are, so that they're as similar to tissue samples as they as they can be for and so useful as controls. Um, that I don't know if you wrote that down or ready to go with that right now, but I am also happy to share a protocol um, with anyone who's interested. You can contact us at support at cell signal. Awesome. Um, so here's a question I often get from customers, the, the, the vice versa of, um, do all IHC antibodies, approved antibodies work in Western blot? Uh, the, I think the answer is similar to that um, between the, the, will an antibody work for, the, for ICC versus IHC? Um, the epitopes may be presented differently. Um, there's, in many cases, there's good correlation, but there, it's not surprising that you might have an antibody that will work well for Western blot and not for IHC and vice versa. All right, let's see here. Oh, yes, this comes up a lot. So it's a question about optimizing antibodies on an auto staining platform. Like, how, what's the best way to go about that? Okay, um, well, we found that a well-validated antibody um, can translate well to an autostainer platform. Um, it depends on the, the autostainer platform that you're using. Some, some are more flexible in regards to what reagents you use and the conditions that you use, um, and, and some are not. So, um, so let's see, how do we do it in-house? Let me think. So we, um, 
So you want to have a good positive tissue, maybe positive and negative controls, and you probably want to run a little titration. Um, if your signal needs needs a improved intensity or if there's background, we'll do some of the things we discussed in, in the presentation today, whether it be uh, back titrating to increase signal, further titrating out uh, to alleviate background, and also considerations can be made based on uh, type of retrieval, buffer, um, and, and as well as antibody incubation times. Um, can, can a researcher combine two antibodies from the same species on a stain? Uh, yes, it is possible. Um, this can be done with fluorescent detection or chromogenic detection. Um, a stripping step must be done in between the um, antibody incubations. And you have to ensure that full stripping has occurred by um, implementing controls or else uh, your staining results will not be accurate. Okay. And as a follow-up, I, I get this question a lot. What's, do you have, are there best stripping conditions? Um, let's see. So I personally haven't done this myself, but I know a protocol that includes um, a boiling in citrate and um, similar to the same used for HIER antigen retrieval. So um, again, controls should be used to make sure that the stripping is complete. And um, in multiplex IHC, sometimes more than one stripping step is needed to completely um, make sure that there's no carryover of that initial antibody. Um, yes, and can dab staining be quantified? Can you, can you quantify that? Um, let's see. So, dab, dab staining can be semi-quantitative. There's there's something called an IHC score. Um, it includes a subjective staining intensity um, and as well as how much staining is observed in tissue. This is something pathologists have been using for years. That's your your one plus your two plus scores. Um, it's also possible to use some sort of software that that can count pixels. Those are there are some uh, commercially available. All right. Um, all right. So, what con uh, what concentration of tween should be used in TBS buffer for diluting the antibody? Well, you stumped me there. <laughs> I, sh <laughs> I, I should know this, but um, unfortunately, I I'm not sure that. But we can certainly get back to you. Concentration yeah, of tween in TBST. Yeah, yeah. We routinely use TBST, but um. Yeah, I'm happy to get back to you on the specifics on that. I'm sure it's on our um, IHC protocol that's on the web too, yeah, but definitely. I'm happy to follow up. <laughs> okay, um, here's another question we got from uh, someone viewing. Is putting 10% sucrose into formalin um, that improve the quality of the tissue and give a better, I, a better IHC stain uh, downstream? Um, is that something you, th you think you, we can comment on? Well, it's not something we've tested in-house. So, so I, I don't speak from experience. I know that we've, we use 10% neutral buffered formalin. We've, you know, we've used it uh, for years and um, it, I, it is the most commonly used fixative um, in labs you know, across the world and in hospitals. And so we do want to, uh, it is our goal to mimic the the results that most of our customers will also get. And so for that reason, we haven't really tried any switches to our, our fixative protocol. Um, so I don't speak from experience. I'm not really sure um, about, about how sucrose may impact the staining results. What I would do is compare it to the standard and, you know, and do side by side staining and see how, how the results may compare. Excellent. All right. Um, so that was the last question that we received. Um, so I guess it's time to bring this webinar to a close. Jessica, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your knowledge in this area. Um, and also a huge thank you to all of you that were able to join us today, listen in and submit questions. We hope you found this webinar helpful and certainly encourage you and your colleagues to join us for more webinars in the future. Um, and as always, never ever hesitate to reach out with any questions you have about CSD products and protocols. Um, we're always happy to help. Get to know your account manager. Um, reach out to technical support. They're always there um, to interact with, um, especially so you can have that conversation with application experts like Jessica. Um, we are the company, of, you know, we like to pride ourselves as a company of scientists for scientists, and we specialize in taking that consultative approach um, so that we can understand 
and best meet your needs. And so with that, again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, be well and take care of each other out there. Thank you.